What a setup. So you're at your mate's place and he's letting you record podcasts from there. So I'm working from here at the moment. So him and I are developing TV series and we are selling them amongst other things as well. So this is our office, but Hunter, he was a, a presenter here, he still is. He's doing a Netflix show right now in the US. So him and I were roommates back in the day. So we've called our production company, wait for it, Roo Mates. So Hunter's an Aussie as well? No, Hunter's American. So he was oh, okay. born and bred in California. What is that creepy pink doll behind you? Mate, I don't, it's all creepy to be honest. <laughs> he's got a big piece of art out there where he's painted himself with no shirt on eating an orange and then he's turned it into a cushion. Yeah, because painting yourself, that's not egocentric at all, but to, to make a cushion. <laughs> oh, that'll be me. Give me a few more years in LA. I'll fit in, I'll fit in nicely yeah. to that world. So back to the show, what sort of themes are you going for? Is well, it- Hunter's doing scripted and I'm doing unscripted and we do unscripted together. So that's the easiest way right now to move things quickly. And particularly, we started this 18 months ago, but there's a writer's strike right now, which means also all the shows that we've had lined up, ready to go, we're getting bigger and better meetings than we ever imagined because ours are all unscripted. So we don't need writers for it. Genius. Really smart formats for reality shows. And this is after years and years of both him and I doing similar stuff in in different countries learning as much as we can from the industry and we've just got great contacts to then take those ideas in and then have them heard but then we know that our ideas are really good and so they're getting turned into shows and so what's the process they obviously buy the idea they buy the show then do they sit on it for a while or will they put it into production so here's the thing we we've sold two and when we say we've sold two we've sold them to very big production companies now, they have the rights to these shows for a couple of years. We get back-end royalties and percentages on the shows. Um, but in their machine, which I can't tell you too much because uh, we're in like the, the definite business end now of talking to the likes of a Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, whatever, whatever. But that's us with this big product, production company going in there. So we right now don't want to produce any of it. We just want to come up with the concept and the idea, be EPs on the show. And then see them come, you know, see them end up somewhere. That's a credit. We're like, great. And we just want to get as many credits as we can. And then eventually we might be like, hey, maybe we want more of the production budget. Let's actually physically make the show. But right now, if Hunter and I were to go to Netflix and be like, hey, guys, really cool idea. And they're like, yeah, we love your idea. And we go, cool. So it's $10 million budget. And they're like, absolutely not. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Cause like what they wouldn't give us $10 million until we've got credibility. But we also really enjoy working with production companies because that's a whole other level of development too and we combine our ideas. Still, I'm still loving the on-camera stuff, but for me, I've just had these weird creative ideas stuck in my brain for so long. But you've always had such a good business mind for Tweeds. I remember even back when you're doing The Loop, Liv was telling me how you would talk to the potential sponsors of the show. You were trying to get more advertising. So you've obviously always had interest in the producing side of things as well. Yeah, well, that that all started at Terrace where you and I went to high school. Film and TV was hands down my favorite topic and subject. Uh, like I, I was good at other ones, but I just knew film and TV was where I wanted to be. So I'm a TV nerd. I'm an editing nerd. I'm a tech nerd. Not, not as techy as you are, that's for sure. I don't know, mate. I suppose, and this has only taken, this has taken, sorry, 10 years to realize this. When I get into an edit and and when I'm working on a creative project and it's something which might not be for a brand, it might not be for a show, it's just purely an idea I have and I want to see it end up on a screen somewhere. That is like my art and that's me doing what I love doing. And I always thought I was wasting time and I always thought, oh, I'm, I'm messing around here, there and everywhere. And, and it's particularly this new wave of now influences coming through, which that's tiny pieces of art as well. Some of them, some of them are just taking photos and clothes, but the thought process, sitting down, writing an idea, going out, executing it, editing it, depending on how big or small it is. For me, I've I've now nurtured that process and gone, hey, I love doing this. But also, I've started to think commercially about how can that work and how much time can I spend on that and where's their bigger money. Yeah, the, the scale of what you're doing now is super impressive. Is it intimidating to go to these studios, Hulu, Netflix, and engage in those discussions as a boy from Brizzy? Not really because... It's just, mate, they're just people. Everyone, I, even right back to when I was interviewing A-listers for The Loop or other shows in Australia, 
mate, they're just people. I don't know. They're really talented people and I respect their line of work and what they do. Or, you know, if it's a musician, you've had a journey going through a breakup or someone in your family passing away. So you're really connected with that artist and their artwork. But at the end of the day, it's just human connection. So do you reckon all of the red carpet experience for your job back in the day sort of allowed you to have that perspective, break down those barriers and kind of just see everyone as normal human beings? I think so. Yeah. I think having good and bad experiences, you you learn how you want to be treated um, and how you want to treat other people as well. So yeah, definitely. I think that's contributed for sure. So yeah, looking back at your time on the loop or in Aussie media, how does that compare to your experience over there now? Does it feel like tiny compared to what you're doing now? Or do you So I moved to the US three years ago with my dream job to work on e news yeah, in New York City, live from 30 Rock, and I was so excited. But I really I quickly realized, even though there's bigger audiences here, bigger budgets, we are so good in Australia at what we do. We have smaller crews, um, but we are all really hungry, particularly Brisbaneites and people from Perth and other parts who have to work hard just to move to Sydney. So we already have one hard barrier to get to Sydney. And even when we're in Sydney, though, or working all over Australia, it's just we have pocket crews that are just so good. Like we have camera guys that are also producing because they've got great ideas and they'll tell you this, that, and everything else. Plus they're usually audio guys because they want to cut out the budget for the audio guys. Mm-hmm. So I've just worked on a lot of guerrilla style shows and and segments uh, for shows that have been really small crews, but everyone is just so talented. So comparing that now to the US, it's hard because I've only worked on like E over here, which is a, a big, big show. But in, compared to other shows in the US, that's a tiny show as well. So I'm only comparing it to one production. But I've got to say, as soon as I got here, I was like, we are good. We are really good in Australia. To go back to that experience in New York, you, you got the job, dream job, and then COVID struck. New York becomes this Will Smith movie where everyone's left the city. What was it like living in such a unique part of New York and go on, the say, history? Go on, say unique. New York. So I have to say, New York. New York. That sounds like a, a voiceover warm up. I think it was. I think it was Ron Burgundy. He was using that before he was going live on air. Um, it was awesome. It was a great year. It was the weirdest year of my life. Uh, I really embraced it. It was nothing went according to plan. I got a new apartment. I had this job. I was on a three year deal with a major network over there. We went from working in a studio to doing five days a week, exactly like this. And it was like, oh, goodness. So yeah. there was two mindsets I could have had. I was like, oh, gosh, this is – I've like hedged so many bets on this and what's this going to equal? But for me, I was like, let's just lap this up. How good is this? Like I'm here in New York. I, I already jumped one hurdle, which was the hardest hurdle, which is getting a US visa to work over there. So I had that automatically. I had a job that was paying me for that year. So I was like, great. So I just had this really amazing experience where half of Manhattan did leave. You were right. It was kind of like a zombie land for about a month there. But it was funny. New Yorkers are really tough people just to live there. It's a tough environment. So they bounced back pretty quickly. So after that first month of where the entire world was like, what the hell is going on right now? Are we all going to die? Are we going to get this thing, COVID-19? Really quickly, that isolation connected people in a way that I've never seen before. So I made these new friendships, the neighborhoods in New York, which is usually a pretty hard place. You know, everyone does connect there, but it's a very lonely place, New York. Mm. Everyone was just talking in parks and on the streets when they're getting coffees. My highlight of my day was leaving my apartment to get a coffee and then going to a cafe and getting a breakfast, which is sort of sparked this love for a breakfast and cafe culture for me on another level, which I'm connected with now. So, yeah, when things don't go according to plan, you can lean into it and just have a really, really cool experience. Uh, And I'll never forget that year. It was one of the greatest years of my life because it was, there was just so much wrong with it. Like I was doing long distance and I wasn't with my girlfriend for a whole year. So it was like, New York's good for two things, being in love with someone and enjoying this romantic experience or dating the whole of Manhattan. I wasn't doing either of those things, (laughs) but I had this connection with this crew that I met through a cafe and then we were doing workouts together. We're going for beers together normally. And like right now in New York, you can't drink on the streets. It's illegal to, to, you know, have any sort of alcohol 
for that period, they were like, let's help the small businesses. Let's help the bars. Everyone go out there, get your takeaway cocktails and party on the streets. What I love about you, Tweeds, and you do this for everything. So many people wouldn't would have had a negative experience with that. They've gone over, they've got their dream job. Suddenly everything's thrown upside down. You're away from your girlfriend, but you naturally just have a sunny disposition where you see the positives of everything and and make make the most of it. It's it's really cool to see, man. I don't know where I got that from, Slater, but I've just always had a well, who cares? Like, what can we do? It's one of those I I just don't hold grudges and a lot of I get thrown a lot of curveballs. I have a lot of rejection in my work. And it's one of those like, okay, who cares? Like, what can we do? Or or let's go get, let's be better. Let's go learn or let's create something that is better that then can turn into a positive. Yeah. Do you ever have down days? I mean, looking at your social media, I think people might be able to assume that you are super positive all the time. Do you ever have days where doubt comes in and you've got to overcome those obstacles? Mate, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, I think that is my biggest weakness is not being as vulnerable with people because on those down days, I do really nurture and look after myself. Um, and I've got a few different channels of things that I do now to sort of assess that and go, okay, where are you at? Do a little bit of a check-in. And I've built a community of friends that I can lean on heavily and my family too. I'm really lucky to be very transparent with them. But yeah, for sure. And like I think anyone in the creative industry it's really hard at times. You're just like, you know, oh my God, do, do people like what I'm doing anymore? Is what I'm making, does it have any substance to it? Is there any purpose to it? I don't know, mm. what am I doing? And I've been really lucky. Just in the last 12 months, I've reached what has always been my dream. Like for my whole career, I've dreamt of this, this role to host a particular show got that after a lot of hard work and a lot of hustling behind the scenes, which people wouldn't see. But so when you also reach that level, I was like, sick, I'm here. Yeah. What do I do now? And it's like, well, what's yeah. what do I want to chase next? Or what's going to make me happy? Or what, what do I enjoy? So you've got to have, have those reset moments. But yeah, of course, like I'm four or five months into being single again. Like I would Ideally, in my life, when I was younger, I was like, 100% would be married by the time I'm 35 and have kids. Mm. But yeah. I'm not. And it's like, well, what can you do about that? You just got to be patient for things as well. I think a lot of people are impatient. So for me, when I have those down days, I've just set up routines now. And this could be because of the areas I've lived in. Like I think living in places like Bondi, Venice Beach, New York City, you've got a lot of people that are open to the fact that we have extreme highs and lows in our industry. And so when you have those lows, if you don't look after yourself, you're going to slip into a pretty dark place. So meditation, yeah, journaling, um, just we go back to the basics, good sleep, exercising, get off the piss, stop drinking so much. Uh, for, for me personally, they've always worked. And I love talking to people about it then. So if I'm just feeling a little bit shit, I've got a few friends that I'm just like, oh, can we just have a chat for a second? And you have like a 20-minute chat and talk it out. And then it's like, that is really nice to have those lines of communication there, which mm. I think you'd have, if you have a partner in life, you'd be doing that with them. But yeah, yeah. because I don't right now, I'll lean on my mates. I don't think that comes naturally to a lot, a lot of fellas because sometimes it takes a tough conversation to break the norm and actually be vulnerable and, and share how you're really feeling. But it's interesting you talk about, like if you're having those down days, you'll go back to meditation, cut the piss, a lot of the time, it's when we just go back to the basics. Are you taking a break from booze? I'd go in like little little phases where I just don't need to. I feel, I don't know, for me, I'm, I'm pretty lucky that I don't feel socially awkward without drinking. Mm. So I'm happy to do a few months where I'll just have a couple here and there. Right now, I just, two weeks ago, I was like, you know what? The last two times I've drunk, the next day for until at least 2 p.m., I just feel like, down and pretty shit. So I was like, I'm just not going to drink for a while. So my biggest challenge, I'm just trying to push myself to see how long I can do this for now, for this little block. I've got a wedding coming up in Hawaii at the end of the week. And I've just decided, I was like, I don't think I'm going to drink at the wedding. And that's going to be, that's going to rattle quite a few of my friends, but I don't really care. I'm just like, that's, I'm fine. I'm confident not to be drinking. But I know for a lot of people, that's their security blanket. And particularly yeah. when they're around like the lads and the mates, they're like, well, come on, mate. It's a special occasion. Just have a champagne or just have this or that. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to 
embrace this special occasion. But for me right now, we are flying on all cylinders with these formats. And I keep looking. Do you reckon there's a filter on? <laughs> a filter on? You've got the LA glamour filter on your Zoom at the moment. I just caught myself <laughs> and I was like, what's going on here? I was about to ask if you've had a lip job over there because they are looking voluptuous. But I don't know what is going on. I, I, I am moisturizing, but it's not working this well. I've definitely got the crow's feet coming on for 35. I've noticed those as well, man. That's my motivation for moisturizing in the morning. I'm just trying to rub out those crow's feet. Dude, I've got a really – I had a hair and makeup lady here in the US that I used six months ago. Um, we were shooting something, and she's told me this brand is the best. Do you want to give them a plug? Or? They're called Jackson Lane. They should be giving me free stuff because I've told Ooh. so many people about it. You know what? It's like they don't need to market to the guys because we won't buy. It's to the, all the girlfriends and the wives or the partners. Mm, yeah, and it just needs to be simple as well. It's just one applicator. Maybe you've got a cleanser, a moisturizer. Just here's the full it. routine, everybody. In the shower, there's like a powder that turns into a paste. You put that on your face. Get out of the shower, dry your face. There's a serum. Two, two. Give us that sound effect again. There's a, there's a, yeah. and then there's a. And that's the vitamin C. Rub that on your face. Put it everywhere. There's like a little um, eye one you pat around there. And at the end of the day, moisturizer. Bang. And, and in the mornings, you've got to put the sunscreen moisturizer on. <laughs> to take a bit of a, a left turn away from our skincare routine, you're doing the Hemsworth Challenge again at the moment. Take me through it. And where are you getting the, the program from? Is this something that's come from his trainers or are you kind of making up as you go? So Dan Churchill, my friend, he's an ambassador for Center. Uh, oh, okay. And Dan is Dan's one of those friends, though, that like he lives and breathes fitness. I think I'm more of a realist where I like being fit, but I, I do a lot. I drink, not at the moment, but I drink, I go out and eat nice foods. I love my breakfast. So I, I'm kind of not at that super fitness level. I'm kind of like an everyday person. However, I've got to tell people I've still got a good metabolism, which is genetic. So it's once again... Friends of mine have done the program with me and their results haven't been as good as mine have been because yeah, okay. of the, the genetics there. So yeah, yeah, for me, I just felt the commitment of that 10 weeks made me feel so good at the end of it. And it wasn't just because like I didn't put on that much size. It was just more feeling fit. My mind was ready to go. I felt like invincible because I'm like, okay, I've got through 10 weeks. I traveled to New York in that time. I did uh, a few other little work trips. And I got to the end of it. You're setting yourself a challenge. And at the end of that, you're fucking achieving it. It gives you so much momentum and confidence just knowing that you can tick those things off. What's the nutrition like? They've got a really good nutrition plan. It's, it's unbelievable. But I've had quite a few trainers over the years. I know what I need to be doing. Listeners, if you haven't seen Scott's breakfast uh, content on TikTok and Instagram, go have a look. Not only will you discover some amazing restaurants around, it's a good watch. Are you... Eating breakfast every day? Are you a fasting man? Or Right now, I'm staying up really late working on these creative projects because I'm also talking to my management in Australia. So I kind of go to bed at about, oh God, 1 or 2 a.m. So that means I have to wake up at about 8, 8 or 9-ish. But for me, it works really well because I'm, I'm very creative and efficient putting these pitch decks together and stuff like that at nighttime. The routine though is wake up, have some water, and try not to have a coffee or anything for at least half an hour. First thing I do when I wake up is don't go on my phone. That's mm. not that's not a reality. I try to do that, but that's 50-50. It's funny how our mind tricks us into it as well. We're like, oh, I'll just check the phone to see if someone so messaged me, then I'll do do my day. But you always get sucked into that bastard. And I'll do I'll scribble every second day, I'll sort of scribble some words down, call it journaling if you want, but just putting some words to paper. It could be about an idea or on a film, it could be about one of the project, it could be anything anything at all. Uh, and then I'll get into to my day, which in LA, it's kind of like I can work from home four days a week and then put all my meetings into the fifth day a week. Uh, one of my strengths here though in this market is networking with people, meeting just incredible people organically. And all of a sudden, you just start finding you're meeting people. And this is the reason why you live in LA and not back in Sydney, which is hands down the most beautiful city in the world apart from Brisbane with that brown snake. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's just, it's why I'm here. It's to meet cool people doing great things. And lo and behold, it's like, oh, I'm a network exec here. 
or I'm the head of this company, or I do this, or I invented this, or so it's it's a boiling pot of really cool people. It really suits your personality as well. You've got a link personality where you not only like connecting others, your strengths are in networking and meeting new people and and putting yourself forward. I'm the guy who loves creating by myself. I'm kind of a little bit more introverted and insular like that. I just like being uncomfortable. I like being yeah. Once again, going all right. I know no one here. Here we go. How do we work? How do we make this work? So for me, I've been lucky because I've had that since I was 21. But Prank Patrol and ABC moved to Melbourne. Had two years there. Bloody lonely years because 20 as a 21 year old, I didn't know anyone there really. Mm. Then went to Sydney and then yeah, New York and now LA. So I. I find it pretty easy to fit into a city and find my people really quickly. One of the greatest things I did was three years ago, started this Aussie Christmas event in the middle of the year. And that's just grown to, it's basically just a big sit down lunch with 120 people. And then we have a rooftop party with another 200 people. But it just came from an idea. I got my friend, Jess Stats, who works for a record label as my business partner or as my founder, whatever you want to call it. We're not really, it's not a business. We're just, yeah. we're just throwing a lunch. First year and the second year, amazing. Uh, but the second year was really hard because we were starting to work again. The first year, everyone was in lockdown. So we had time to to prepare it, plan it. Everyone came out of lockdown and we threw just lunch. Back to why I did that, though, is just connecting Aussies and Americans together. And I think by me throwing that, I've just met so many cool people, which has sort of catapulted me in this city to now yeah, know right. a lot a lot of people from that event. If you get to a new city, whether it's New York, LA, how do you find these connections? The common denominator has been either surfing or it has been cafes. Like here in Venice, there's a great Aussie cafe called Great White. On Wednesdays, they have the Great White Swim Club, which is similar to that one you guys have, the Salties in Bondi, I think it is. Yep, Bondi Salties. So that like, that's awesome. There's just lots of little community things that are happening. Um, particularly in a city like Los Angeles where it can be very, very lonely. So I think I'm drawn to Venice Beach. People roll their eyes at Venice like, oh, Aussie in Venice, you got the beach and the cafes. And it's like, yeah, that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, so that's an interesting point. It's all about those kind of community things you can do during the week, whether it's sport or a morning swim with new people. And that's a really great way to feel ingrained in the community. Community is so important. I think my highest high in life is seeing new people connect and new people come together and watching people thrive. I think for me, and that's why if it's just having a dinner party, putting on a small party for my friends or throwing on throwing a big event or creating content that actually gets people connected or just even starts a conversation with me, that's my new challenge in the next sort of six to 12 months is where am I going to go with personal content because I'm doing other content with idle and then also other content with productions that i'm working on but it's like for my personal stuff what actually do i care about where's their purpose how do i bring yeah. people together what i find with social media there are so many different ways you can take it and with you you've got so many different interests sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming to try and work out which path to take it mate especially me i'm like ah, 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 ah. Haven't been diagnosed yet, but 100% have ADHD, for sure. <laughs> I'm one of these new ones that's like, mm, let's look back at your life, mate, and go, look and like it, look and like it. <laughs> it adds up. I'm still embracing it right now. I'm embracing it, but I have people working with me. Um, my amazing management in Australia who are awesome, they're kind of helping me channel through all that and going, what do we want to do? In for, for, the, for the next five years, 10 years, and where's your real strengths at? Stop doing this, do more of this. Oh, that's good. It's good that they can give you that guidance. It's really good. You need people like that on your side. But at the same time, I don't want to ignore things just for trying to earn more money. Like I want to embrace creative ideas. I love being a weirdo. That's my favorite yeah. thing, is being a weirdo. You should make that your Insta bio. But mate, back to Idol, how was that experience for you? So if you don't know, Scott was the host of Australian Idol, which must have been a dream gig for you, right? Yeah, co-host with Ricky Lee. Um, I didn't meet her. We didn't screen test together, which is really bizarre in, in this day and age with TV. Usually they want a chemistry test to make sure you guys get on well. But I did my first screen test. Well, two years ago, I had my first Zoom like this with the execs from Channel 7, and it went for about an hour 
just more of a get to know you. They're like, hey, we've just bought the rights to Idol. We've got our eye on you, blah, 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 blah. A year later, COVID hit Australia really badly. Bang, Idol's off the table. Bang, Idol's back on again. And then at this point, I was like, I was just getting into a better groove here in LA. So I was like, I don't really care anymore. It would have been great when I was ready, but I don't, whatever. If I do, cool. Then I did a screen test here and I got so prepared for the screen test that for me, it became a bigger deal. And I was like, you know what? Idol is such a great format. I love music so much. I worked on a music show for eight years. I've done a lot of live TV. If there's one job that is made for me right now where I'm at in my career, it's Australian Idol. And I just started believing in the fact that I would be really good for this show. And I think for the contestants on the show, for the judges on the show, and for the viewers, I think I'd be a really good host for the show. So I just believed in myself. I was like, this is it. This is the one. Smash my screen test. If I didn't get it from that, I was like, who cares? Yeah. Then yeah. I played the waiting game for like two months. And man, that was cruel because I Ooh. couldn't plan. I couldn't plan the second half of my year because they blocked me out for dates, but I hadn't got the gig. Right. Yeah. Got the phone call. Got the job. They're like, you've got yeah. a female co-host. We can't tell you who. And I'm like, what? Didn't know who it was. <laughs> Found out it was Ricky Lee. She is the biggest legend. What you see is what you get. So, yeah, we basically, I, I got signed. I was so excited. I then knew I was coming back to Australia for two months to film the auditions. I'd come back to LA for two months, then back to Australia for two months to do the live shows. But I didn't know who the co-host was. I knew it was a female. Did you just assume it was Sonia Kruger at this point? I, I thought it was. And I also, <laughs> I have done a screen test with Sonia Kruger before to host The Voice and didn't get it. But, um, yeah, for me, I heard through Joe, she's like, you want to hope it's Ricky because she is awesome. She's so talented. She's the greatest girl, so down to earth. And what you see is what you get. She is just an absolute legend, a true blue Bogan from the Gold Coast who's Best just kind. had a great career and she's seriously talented and knows the idol format really well. So it was a gift to be hosting with her. Yeah. Did it make your job easier? For sure. Her and I were so comfortable with each other and particularly when you're live, our first live record recording, so many things were going wrong, <laughs> but we just kept it cool. Like we... Almost would give each other smiles like, I know what's going on. We're like, yeah, we know what's going on. So we were enjoying it a lot. Are you guys going to be doing it next year as well? Yeah, well, so we haven't been greenlit yet. This is like TV. Yeah. So they commission it. We'll find out the next month or two um, whether it goes again. I've got a good feeling about it. We were yeah. just out filming on the American Idol set, which is uh, a lot of fun to see how their show works compared to our show. Very similar, to be honest. Yeah. We're lucky. We're really lucky because we film it in a theatre and the theatre has 1,300 people, so it's so loud. So the energy in there is crazy, whereas the US and, and also like the shows like The Voice, when they're in a studio, you can only get about 500 people in there. I think the US had maybe 600 people, so we had almost double the size of the audience. So when we yeah. walk out, it goes all the way up and it's just like this noise. I was like, oh. That's yeah, going to be. I feel like a rock star, even though we're that's not. That's your rock star moment. That's what I was going to say. It's either that or the DJing, man. When are we going to see you on Coachella main stage with the DJing? Oh, it's a matter of days, you know, <laughs> to, like, to like call me up and go, we saw you playing at Buddies in Newtown. <laughs> Get him up there. Here's, here's one resume. thing. And tying back to what you were asking me earlier about how, how do I look after myself and when I have those lows, my relationship with music has always been strong. But I think in the last three years since COVID, it's entered another level of how, how important music's been in my life. Just listening to it, getting myself, if I'm meditating or getting myself in a really relaxed state before doing a live show, creating the mood for my team on Idol in the dressing room with Eleni and Carla and whoever else we've got with us. Music for me is a way to put people in a really good mood. And I think I don't know. I wish I was a musician, but I'm not. But I have so much respect for what they do and how much they influence and affect our lives. So yeah, it is a big a big deal for me. And that's why since – did you ever come to one of our Man Mansion house parties in Rose Bay? I didn't, no. Oh, that was lots, wild. Lots about them. That was wild. Just for people listening, I lived in a six-bedroom shitty mansion in Rose Bay, but we loved it. It was awesome. So six of us, and we're all from different parts of Australia. One guy from Melbourne, two from Brizzy, Sydney, 
uh, Perth, uh, Adelaide. There's two Adelaide guys that came through. So we'd throw big parties there. We'd throw New Year's Eve parties. So I learned to DJ living there with the Red Bull guys because they were like the Red Bull DJs. They drive around those little trucks. So for me, DJ is so easy. Anyone can do it. It's just you got to have a passion for music to know what to play. I've actually heard that Danny Clayton's responsible for your DJing, mate. (laughs) (laughs) Danny's the best dude. Uh, When I came back, when I was in Australia for the first block of Idol, um, I played once at my friend's bar and I was like, this is so fun. So I hit up Danny and I was like, I know you know all the DJs and all the, the bookers and stuff like that. When I come back for summer, I want to do some gigs. And he was like 100% just took me through everything, the who's who, how to do this, how to do that. And like it turned out I didn't have that much time to DJ when I was back there. But him and I got to play together one night. He never played with me. And so, you know, Danny's been doing it for, I want to say 20 years. He's like, Clever. He's, he's everywhere. And I just don't think he, he thought I knew what I was doing. So him and I had so much fun because after we mixed the first song and he just looked at me and he was like, oh, sweet. <laughs> I think you're going to be fine. <laughs> so then him and I, we had a great night together. It was a lot of fun. I'm pretty hyperactive. I get around the decks and jump around and just have a good time because at the end of the day, I don't care. You know, there's really good DJs out there. I'm not a really good DJ, but I'm good enough to throw a party with friends. So that's all I want to do. seems like you've got a really good balance. Venice life. Are you getting out for surfs there? Or is there- We're probably going once a week. We'd like to be going three times a week, but... It's you just wake up and you look at this mush onshore breezes and you're like, well, unless we drive 40 minutes up to Malibu or down to, you know, San Clemente or El Porto, it's it's tricky around here. You've got to kind of just ride the slop. But yeah. I, that's, I forgot how awesome the waves are back in Australia when I went back there for Idol. The, the best part about living here is no matter what, like the basement for us, like the complete fuck up if you – ruin everything here or you can't make it or whatever you go home to australia do you have any any fear of that happening i know a lot of actors move out there and they're kind of scared to come home with their tail between their legs if it didn't work out but you seem very happy to just jump between both countries for sure yeah i just think longer term i'm going to be here because of how it's going to work out for me professionally um but no, I've got no fear of coming back. I just, right now, I think this city and the energy of the city and how I operate, it's working really well. Now, I'm not saying I've, I've achieved what I want to achieve. Like, mate, I'm, I'm in the bunkers, but fighting at the moment, going hard. But every day I'm seeing more and more that like the hard work I'm doing is paying off. How do you see it working out? Do you think you'll be doing more presenter gigs or do you think... In the future, you'll be more focused on scripting and producing shows, or are you just going with the flow, surrendering and seeing what happens? No, I've been quite strategic about what I'm going for. Um, for me right now, I'm not pushing hard for presenting in the US. I, I love doing it. Idol for me ticks that box. I get the dopamine coming back for a show like that. I, I believe in the future, there'll be more Australian projects that I'd love to be doing. And it means I can get to come back, spend time in Australia and see everyone I want to see and just also bring a little bit more of a different perspective rather than living in Australia right now, bringing some stuff I've seen here and bring it back home. So I love doing that. Um, There's some shows and things that I might host. Here's the other thing. When creating shows here, you don't put yourself as talent. If you put yourself as talent, you're making it so much harder for yourself. And I learned that after about a year. I'm trying right. to create a show that I could host. And then I was like, take me out of there. It, it multiplies your chances by a thousand because whoever the network buys it or if Netflix is looking for it, they can put whoever they want in there. And they like having independence and control to do whatever. Exactly. They want. And it just, it's a nice divide there. It's like, I'm not doing this to host. And, and it's, it took a few meetings with people I knew in the industry to get their head around that. Then once they realize I'm being serious about a really good idea and a really good format and going, this can work in every market in the world. It hasn't been done yet. Here's how it works. And they go, we love it. And I'm like, put whoever you want in there. I don't care. I want to sell it to you and I want to walk away and I want to create my next one. Can you give us a little taste of what sort of genres we can expect? Or do you, I can't, do you have any- <laughs> I can't because we're... Give me a little teaser that I can put in Instagram reel and just... 
sell you out. <laughs> and, I, I just want to see how are you going, Slater? Because, like, mate, you watching you, you work so hard and you are grinding away. Like, I think a lot of people that know you really well, um, especially from our school, Nick and I went to school together, and people we we grew up with lawyers, doctors, bankers. People in property, and that's kind of if you throw a blanket over our friends, that's the majority of them. And Slater's in this outliers like us. It's a creative industry. He's an actor, audio producer from Nova Days. How are you going, mate? How are you finding the industry right now? Yeah, going to the school we did, a private school where everyone's a doctor, everyone's a lawyer. I often feel like my work is even more kind of insular because I can't relate to a lot of my friends on that level. So I'm just chipping away, doing my own thing. The podcast, to be honest, has been a huge move, step forward towards where I really want to take my business. Because like we were saying before, with social media, there are so many different angles and avenues you can take it. So you kind of have to be specific about where you want to go. But for me, what I align most with is my content around transformation, self-improvement. And I can kind of see that being the future of where I want to go professionally and personally. So it makes sense for me to do a podcast on it because it's tying in all these themes that I love. And then the other thing is, because my job as a, uh, an actor, a uh, content creator can be quite insular, I often miss out on the connection and the, the FaceTime with people during the week. And this is another reason why I love the podcast, because I can chat with yourself and have a really deep, thorough conversation for an hour, do a couple of those each week. And it just adds that huge sense of fulfillment for me. Yeah, no, it's, it's important. When are you coming out here next? You've got plans to come to the US soon? I want to get over there this year. So I've just gone, gone through a bit of a management change. It kind of represented where I was at with acting, where I kind of needed to reshuffle things and refocus and breathe a bit more energy into it. So I've done that. I wanted to make sure that I give the podcast a really great shot and set up all the structures properly before kind of focusing on acting again. What I'm doing in between auditions is creating stuff for Instagram, which has actually, as silly as those skits are and as ridiculous it is putting a, a tea towel on your head on Wednesday morning, they actually do help with acting because you're writing, you're editing, you're thinking about the scene from a sort of a step back. It actually has really helped polish some of those acting tools. So I'll keep doing that as well. But yeah, it's, it's a funny thing going back to that. I was going to ask you about this actually with coming from a school where none of our friends work in media. It can be quite isolating did you have any thoughts or struggles against going against a mold like that or maybe not being able to relate with your friends in that way? I never did, but then it's funny when you have like lulls in, in productions or I was on the loop for a long time and there was that bigger gig just wasn't there and you, you, I found myself going back for Christmas time or at barbecues at friends' houses and you get in those conversations. It's not really your friends. I think your friends are cool. It's more their parents or, to be honest, the biggest thing right now is giving my mum a line to say to her friends. Like your parents just want to be proud and telling people what their son's up to. And and now that I'm doing a lot more of this development stuff, my mum just couldn't get her head around it. And I was right, like, yeah. I was like, all right, here's, you know, write down a line, learn this. This is what you can tell them. And it will make a lot more sense to them. And she's like, oh, great. And she was so happy when she had that. Yeah, I get that all the time from my mum, especially with content. She's like, so Nick, do you think this will would be a proper job for you soon <laughs> i was like mom it's paying the bills pretty well like i'm, I'm really happy doing it they just because it, it's such a new industry they don't really validate it as a career because so i moved from brisbane at 21 i've now like, 14 years been out of brizzy so for me it's been fine i've just sort of always surrounded myself with people like that and my school friends support me fully they they do look at me sometimes and be like like you're wild but they also I think they knew I had it in me. They're like, they're like, we always knew you were going to make whatever you want to do because you're just a go getter. Like you're, even if it wasn't presenting, whatever it would have been. I think I always backed myself, and I will always find a way. If I get a no, I love that because I'm like, cool. I'll just find another way, or I'll, yeah. I'll work through that no. And I think my school friends knew that from the school days of even like being a school cap, not school captain, the house captain, and stuff like that. I was always just a little hustler. Watching, I don't think it was until Idol for a lot of them, or maybe E, that a lot of them were like, "Oh, like you're you're sort of reaching a reputable level now." Can, even like with the loop, they were a bit like, yeah, mm, "Cool, yeah. like don't really get." Especially Prank Patrol, which is it was tough, you know, because my first ever gig on TV, so I was so excited, 
but it was a kid's show and it was the content for people in their 20s was extremely lame. But for kids that were 8 to 13, they frothed on it. They thought it was the best thing ever. Loved it. And then they obviously were watching episodes and they were like, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> and I was watching some go, because I went 110% into it. Yeah, my, yeah. my director from day one, he's like, hey, you've got two lanes. You can either be too cool and it just won't translate, fully commit, and this show will be a success. Do you reckon that formed your mindset with how you approach presenting and content with everything moving beyond that? Yeah, 100%. Name's Peter Lawler. He's one of the biggest directors in the country, one of the biggest comedy directors. And that was the best advice I had early on in my career because I didn't really know what I was doing on set. And he was just like, honestly, looking at this on paper, and because the UK and the Canadian shows had already aired. So I watched some of their episodes and I was like, oh, man, this is lame. And he was like, if you fully lean into it and just give it everything and you almost, the joke is you and you put the joke on yourself, he's like, you're going to, it's going to be great. And yeah, and it did connect really well with Aussies to the, to the point where now still my strongest content on TikTok. And when I come back to Australia, even though I've hosted Idol, I'm at pubs now, I'm at bars and it's still all the Aussies going prank patrol. It's amazing, isn't it? And now those 13-year-olds are proper adults. Yeah, they're adults. And they're, and they're, they're like, look, we shared a, I shared like a really unique bond with them. They were coming home from school, turning their tellies on, and my show was on. There was nothing educational about it. But I've got this really nice bond with young Aussies and now older Aussies that we all grew up together. I was growing up in my career with them and now watching the show that we were doing. So yeah. it's almost like I can go out to pubs the more rural and the more regional the pubs, the stronger it is. But if I go even out to the inner west of Sydney or parts of Brisbane and Melbourne and whatever, it's almost like I know I'm going to be backed up by kids in the pub. If anything was to happen tonight, some of these guys have got my back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying I'm, this. Is, this is nice. It's even nice to be a guest on a show like this, just to have a chat with someone from home. I just love having proper conversations, deep conversations, especially – when you can talk about things like what you're struggling with, how you're overcoming them. Do you know what we have, before we go, there's this thing we do in LA and this is such a Venice thing. So like if people are watching this, they, they might not get it. But I've got now some new friends and they're also really creative and very successful. They're a little bit older than me. They're around 40, 41, 42. And we've got a group that comes together about once a month and we basically have no agenda when we hang out. There's six of us no phones, we get in a room and we will come up with just creative ideas, whether it's like a jingle, whether it's a, an ad, whether it's like a format for a show and just have a laugh and just see what happens in that night. So it's one of these things like no agenda and we're actually creating them for the product to go nowhere as well. It's just like let's have a fun night. I think as men, we'll often always bond over beers and in a pub and we're like let's not do that. And let's just be creative and be silly and have some fun for a night and see what happens. It is hilarious, mate. It is so good. Basically, one of the things that we do, you'll you'll love this, is if one of us is like newly dating a girl, we will go to her Instagram page and we're allowed to look at three photos. So we'll get <laughs> it up, three photos. And then the rest of us see those photos and the caption and we're like, okay, got it. And we'll do an improv scene acting out with the with our mate that's dating her <laughs> and the girl and seeing where the scene goes. This so is it brilliant. is so funny. It is the funniest thing. If someone's <laughs> nearly dating a girl and she might have like a little dog in the photo or might be one of her girlfriend's birthdays and stuff like that. <laughs> and you've got to do an improv scene where we can keep joining the scene and bumping each other in and out and seeing where these scenes go. I'll tell you what, I it is it. a good laugh. Everyone should be doing that with their friends. What I love about that is just putting the joy of creating stuff, mucking around without any outcome in mind, without trying to create like this polished, perfect piece of content. It's just like a, a free, easy night where you can be creative and silly. And I think a lot of us are just kind of reminded when we're in our teenage years, when we run around with like a video camera, creating like skate videos or something like that, we're just having fun. Yeah. We've all got our stresses. We've all got our work we're working on. But just let that go and just be there. But also it's like a mini check-in with each other too. It's like just a nice bonding night. So 
it's hard to do. I can't see people in cities in Australia doing that easily. But if you can muster up some of your friends, particularly guys, and girls should do this too, but we're talking from a male's perspective, it's a really cool thing to just have like this no agenda night where it's just have some fun, have a laugh. Well, I reckon that's a pretty pretty good place to leave it, man. But before we go, this being the Becoming Podcast, one question I've asked every guest before they go, we've kind of touched on this with your quest for simplicity and the things you do when you're when you're struggling a bit, but what's the version of Tweeds that you aspire to become? The version of Tweeds that I would like to become or I'm trying to become or I'm embracing it every single day is one that I can have a bigger community around me, but I can help people as well. So for me right now, I want to create productions that I can hire younger Aussies that aspire to be, you know, at a certain level and go, well, you're not there yet, but let's let's work together. And here's my experience and here's my contacts. I want to share them with you. And also find other young talent, doesn't be Australians, people from anywhere in the world, that have really good ideas, but they don't have the contacts to sell that idea or to get financing for that idea. And I want to be sort of a gateway for that. We're going, well, actually, my friend at Amazon, he's awesome. Your idea is awesome. I'm going to connect you guys and watch those shows come to life. So for me, I think I've still got another five to 10 years. I hate putting time loops in. I've got a long, I've still got many more years of learning and, and creating what I want to do professionally. But on a personal level, I just want to keep stopping and going, hang on, don't make it just about you. How can you help other people? Or what are you doing for other people in the industry? That was a long answer. I know, I know you like sound, I know you like sound bites. And I was like, I could just go, oh, shut up, Scott. My my audio producer background will be able to find a nice little hook out of that. So don't you worry. This has been a treat. Thanks heaps for your time, man. I know it's Sunday afternoon there, so appreciate you coming on. Too good, mate. Good All to right, see you, brother. Soon.